Okay guys, in this video we are going to be discussing uh, the properties of real gases. And the thing about real gases is that you, you cannot neglect the intermolecular interactions between, between the molecules. And so that gives rise to non-ideal behavior when the pressure of the gas is high or if the temperature is particularly low. And on the next slide, I have a figure uh, from the textbook that illustrates uh, the interaction between two gas molecules. And so what we're plotting here on the y-axis is the potential energy of interaction as a function of the separation between the two molecules. Now, for an ideal gas, we say that there are no intermolecular interactions between molecules. So for the ideal gas, uh, the potential energy would be zero. For real gas molecules, however, there are both uh, attractive and repulsive interactions corresponding to different, um, different inter intermolecular distances. At very large uh, intermolecular spacings, the potential energy of interaction is zero. That is, if the molecules are far enough apart, they essentially behave ideally, which is why for low, pre for low pressure uh, experimental conditions, which allows the molecules to get very far apart from one another, uh, you find that all gases behave ideally. However, as you start ramping up the pressure, then the uh, molecules are going to start exploring intermolecular distances that are much closer to one another. And what we find there is that the potential energy of interaction uh, is attracted and we see that the energy goes down. Okay, so, uh, so, so the potential energy as you start decreasing the distance between the molecules you see that it starts to get lower and lower and lower. That corresponds to attractive interactions between the molecules. You pass through a minimum okay, at a particular internuclear or intermolecular uh, spacing and then as you start to really push the molecules on top of one another, you find that repulsive interactions start kicking in and you see that the potential energy starts to go up and up and up. And it just keeps going up to infinity as you try to put the molecules exactly on top of one another. So it's these uh, attractive and repulsive uh, intermolecular interactions that give rise to non-ideal gas behavior. Uh, one of the consequences of, um, of these interactions is that you can compress, under certain conditions, you can compress a real gas into a liquid. That is, if you squeeze the gas hard enough, it will eventually condense to form a liquid phase. Ideal gases, on the other hand, they cannot be uh, liquefied at all. Uh, they, uh, since there are no intermolecular interactions between them, there's nothing that would hold them together in the liquid state. And I have a, um, some figures illustrating liquefaction of a gas. So what we're looking at uh, in this figure, we'll start with the top panel. Uh, we're looking at a series of isotherms for a real gas, carbon dioxide, at several different temperatures. So we're plotting pressure as a function of volume uh, for different temperatures, as you can see. And so way out here, uh, where we have large molar volumes, the pressure is, is more or less low. Okay, And so out in this range, the, the gas is behaving ideally. Uh, if you're at high temperatures, which also corresponds to ideal gas behavior, uh, such as this 50 degrees Celsius curve, you see that as you start squeezing the gas, that is, as we're decreasing its molar volume, we see that the pressure goes up and up and up. And this more or less looks like an ideal gas isotherm. Not quite, I'm sure there's some distortion, but, uh, but more or less it looks like an ideal gas isotherm. As you start lowering the temperature, so as you go from 50 degrees Celsius to 40 degrees Celsius, down to 20 degrees Celsius, you start to see a uh, qualitative difference uh, in the shape of the isotherm. So let's take the 20 degrees uh, isotherm as an example and which is shown here in this bottom panel and we'll 
just walk step by step through it. So at, at large molar volumes, low pressures, the gas is behaving ideally. As you start to squeeze the gas, uh, eventually the pressure starts going up, of course. But what happens at a certain point is that the pressure stops rising. Even though you're compressing the gas, so you're going to smaller and smaller volume. The pressure stops rising, and then very suddenly you squeeze it just a little bit more, and then the pressure skyrockets. It jumps up very quickly. What's going on in this uh, plateau region here is you are, you are condensing the gas into the liquid state. So between point C and point E, we have the gas in equilibrium with the liquid state. Uh, once you get all the way over here to uh, point E, you've essentially converted all of the gas into the liquid state. Liquids are incompressible fluids, and so if you squeeze just a little tiny bit on a liquid, the pressure really jumps up quickly. And so that's what's going on with this uh, steep, uh, steep incline here, is that you're trying to compress a liquid, which is very difficult to do, and so the pressure just goes through the roof. Uh, I will draw your attention to this special point here where we have this star. This isotherm for CO2, uh, which is at 31.04 degrees Celsius, this is called the critical temperature. And the reason it's called the critical temperature is because at all temperatures above this critical temperature, you will not observe a liquid phase for CO2. In fact, you won't observe any difference at all between liquid CO2 and gaseous CO2. We say that uh, in this region, what we have is a supercritical fluid. Below that temperature, however, it is possible to condense the CO2 into the liquid state uh, as long as you have the, you know, a small enough molar volume. And so we have uh, in this range right here, this, this uh, beige shaded uh, region, we have the gas and liquid in equilibrium. Over in this region here and above, we have the gas. Above this blue curve, we have the supercritical fluid region. And then this funny shaped wedge, if you follow the blue curve down to here and then follow this, this uh, dotted line down, that would be the liquid, uh, liquid region. For CO2. Okay, so we can, we can almost think of this as a, as a phase diagram in a sense. What we're going to talk about next is a way to um, quantify the, um, how, uh, how the real gas behaves compared to an ideal gas. So we want to quantify deviations from ideal gas behavior. And a common way to do that is using what's called the compressibility factor. Here, here we're using the symbol capital Z uh, to denote the compressibility factor. And you, it is a ratio. Okay, So the compressibility factor is the ratio of the real gas pressure times the real gas molar volume divided by R times the actual temperature of the gas. So the compressibility factor is actually an experimentally calculated quantity. You go into lab and you measure all of these parameters, these variables, for the gas under its given conditions, and that gives you the compressibility factor. For um, what you can do is if you replace P with the real gas pressure, you can then replace uh, RT over the molar volume with the ideal gas pressure. And so you can also think of the compressibility factor as a ratio between the real gas pressure and the ideal gas pressure. Now, if the gas were behaving ideally, then the real gas pressure would be equal to the ideal pressure, and so the value of Z for ideal behavior would be 1. Okay, so, so this is the uh, perfect gas limit for the compressibility factor. As the pressure decreases for any gas, the compressibility factor will will converge to a value of 1. Now, in addition to being able to define the perfect gas limit, uh, you can also say something about uh, the dominance, relative dominance, of attractive versus repulsive interactions uh, in, the, in your sample of gas by looking at the, the value and comparing it to 1. For the case where the compressibility factor is less than 1, 
that means that the real gas pressure is smaller than the ideal gas pressure. And the way that I like to think about that is that the gas, you know, the gas pressure is due to gas molecules hitting the wall. If the real gas pressure is less than the ideal gas pressure, it's like the molecules are, are being pulled in on themselves. Okay, and so that means that attractive interactions are dominating under those particular experimental conditions. However, you could do the you could calculate the compressibility factor under a different set of um, experimental conditions. You might find that the compressibility factor is greater than one. That means that the real gas pressure is larger than the ideal gas pressure. And the way I think about that, it's like the molecules are hitting the wall extra hard compared to the ideal gas. And so it's like the molecules are trying to get away from each other. Uh, and so we would say that the repulsive interactions uh, are dominant. If you calculate uh, Z and it's close to 1, you could either be in the ideal gas uh, limit or you might just be in a funny situation where the attractive and repulsive interactions are, are canceling out. Uh, and we'll look at, we'll look at that uh, in a moment or two. What I'm plotting here is the compressibility factor Z for, uh, for, for different gases uh, at, um, at different pressures. So we're looking at Z as a function of pressure for several different gases. And what you find is that um, you know, this, this, this behavior that you're seeing shows the deviations from ideal gas behavior uh, at large pressures. Notice that the pressure scale here is quite large, right? Uh, atmospheric pressure, 1 atm, is way over here uh, in this corner, and you find that all of these gases, more or less, are behaving ideally at very low pressures. But as you start increasing the pressures to quite high, what you find is you get deviations from the, um, from the perfect gas result. And in some cases, you know, for some conditions, we find that Z is less than 1. Okay, that indicates that attractive interactions are dominating. However, when you find that Z is greater than 1, that means that repulsive interactions are dominating. Okay, and so what you want to be able to do is to um, use the compressibility factor to determine whether or not attractive or repulsive interactions are dominating uh, for a given set of experimental conditions. Okay, so here we have a, um, a practice problem for us to try. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and switch over. Switch over to my camera view here. And we'll work through uh, we'll work through this problem. So the molar volume of a perfect gas uh, at 500 Kelvin and 100 bars is given to us at 0.416 uh, cubic decimeters per mole. The molar volume of carbon dioxide under the same conditions is 0 0.367 liters per mole. Calculate the compressibility factor, and comment on the nature of the uh, which intermolecular interactions are dominant. So let's write out what we have. Okay, so we've got that the temperature is 500 Kelvin. We've got a pressure of one bar. And we know the molar volume is 0 0.416 liters per mole. And so this is for a perfect gas, as it says. So this is under ideal conditions. Um, for uh, carbon dioxide under the same conditions, they tell us that the, uh, uh, the molar volume is 0 0.366, we'll call it liters per mole calculate the compressibility factor. So the compressibility factor by definition is the pressure of the gas times the molar volume over RT. Previously we looked at 
a form where we left this as the real pressure. So that was real. And then we replaced this with P ideal. Well, that's not the only way that we could do this. We could also um, leave this as the real molar volume. And we could replace RT over P with the ideal volume, ideal molar volume. Okay, so we can use either form here to, um, to work this problem. It's more convenient to do this one. So we're going to take the 0 0.366, that's the real uh, molar volume for CO2, and we'll divide it by the 0 0.416. And so I'm getting a value of 0 0.879. Okay, it's unitless. We see that it's less than 1, so it's definitely not behaving ideally. And then how, how should we think about this? I, I, I prefer to go back to, to this ratio here. We see that since Z is less than 1, that means that the, um, the real gas pressure is lower than what you would expect for an ideal gas. Okay? And when the pressure is lower than what you would expect for the ideal gas, it's like the gas molecules are pulling in on themselves. Okay? And so that tells us that attractive, attractive interactions are dominant. Okay? And so you want to be able to do calculations with the compressibility factor equation and then be able to make a logical conclusion based on based on the value of the compressibility factor so we'll move on to our next topic um, well if the gas is not behaving ideally then you really can't uh, expect to use the ideal gas equation of state to describe the state of a gas. So what do you do in, in that case? Well, there's a couple of different approaches. And the first approach uh, involves what's called the virial equation of state. The virial equation of state offers a very accurate way to calculate the properties of a gas, a real gas. However, it involves um, an infinite series, uh, which ultimately you would have to truncate at some point, uh, and that's, that series uh, involves a series that involves several time-dependent, not time-dependent, several temperature-dependent uh, coefficients. So here is the virial series uh, expansion for the compressibility factor of a real gas in terms of pressure. And so you can calculate the um, compressibility factor uh, by using this, uh, this sum here. And so we see that the first term is 1. Uh, the second term involves a temperature dependent coefficient times the pressure plus another temperature dependent coefficient times the pressure squared and then there would be another temperature dependent coefficient times pressure cubed and so on. And so what you need to do is, is measure what are these coefficients uh, for all different temperatures. So you would have to do a lot of experiments to then determine what these, um, what these values are. And, and that's been done for many gases, and you can look these coefficients up in, um, in various tables. Uh, if you don't like to work with the pressures, you can also express the virial um, equation of state in terms of the molar volumes. Notice that they're in the denominator. So you have 1 plus a different coefficient divided by the molar volume plus another coefficient divided by the molar volume squared and then there would be another term where you have a coefficient divided by the molar volume cubed and it would just keep going on and on and on. Uh, notice when in this first equation of state here when the value of pressure starts getting smaller and smaller uh, the leading order term is going to be just one, right? As pressure goes to zero, uh, the compressibility factor goes to one, which is what you would expect for ideal gas behavior. So this, this is certainly consistent with the ideal gas limit. 
Um, another thing to note about this particular equation of state, uh, for example, let me go back to the figure here. Notice how the compressibility factor for different gases, they have a particular slope at, um, at low pressures. Right here, these, these three all have a negative slope, whereas this one has a positive slope for hydrogen. The slope of that compressibility curve as a function of pressure, its value would be equal to uh, what's called the second virial coefficient. So that's what the, the B term is called. It's called the second virial coefficient. The Cs are called the third, and then you'd have the fourth and the fifth and the sixth, etc. Uh, the term virial, uh, it's an old, old term referring to uh, a force. Uh, and the reason it, this is called the virial equation of state is because that second virial coefficient in, is actually related to uh, the intermolecular interactions between the molecules, which determine the forces acting on the molecules. And so that's, that's why this is called the virial uh, series expansion because this second virial coefficient can be related to those interactions. Uh, what's observed is that um, that the second virial coefficient is typically negative at, at low temperatures and will increase with, with temperature. And here's a table of values for different gases and you see that uh, for low temperatures they're all negative and then as you increase the temperature the dominant behaviors that you see that the, the, the second virial coefficient increases and eventually becomes positive. Uh, there's a point of interest because the virial coefficient goes from negative values to positive values as a function of temperature, there is a particular temperature where the second virial coefficient vanishes and this is called the boil temperature and at the boil temperature uh, you can imagine that there is a cancellation occurring between the attractive and repulsive interactions between gas molecules. And I think I have an illustration of that right here. So here we've got the compressibility factor as a function of pressure. We've got ideal gas behavior where the compressibility factor is equal to 1. At low temperatures, the second virial coefficient is negative, and so you have a downward sloping compressibility factor. At high temperatures, the second virial coefficient is positive, and so you have an upward sloping compressibility factor. At the boil temperature, you see that for the boil temperature, the, um, the compressibility factor follows the ideal gas result uh, up to you know reasonably high pressures and then ultimately you get deviations from that and the reason for that is because that at moderately low pressures it's the second virial coefficient that dominates the compressibility factor and so if, if the second virial coefficient happens to be zero uh, at that boil temperature then the compressibility factor is going to be pretty close to one until the pressure gets large enough for uh, the third and fourth and fifth uh, uh, virial coefficients to, to make a difference. And so that's the behavior that we're seeing uh, in, in these curves here. Uh, let me just check back to make sure. Okay, so I think I've covered everything on that one. Uh, here we are going to use the, uh, the virial equation in a little problem. Uh, we are being asked to estimate the compressibility factor and the pressure exerted at 100 Kelvin by 0.104 moles of oxygen gas in a vessel of volume 0 0.225 uh, liters. The second virial coefficient is given to us. It's minus 197.5 at this temperature. So we're going to be. I'm going to go ahead and write down the two forms of the virial equation that we're going to be working with. There's, there's this one where we had B prime. The prime doesn't denote a derivative, it's just a particular coefficient. Uh, and that's times pressure. And then the other form, the one that 
we're going to be working with, I believe explicitly in this problem, 1 plus b of t, and that's divided by the molar volume. And so we are going to be, not squared, but just as a first power. This is a truncation of the uh, of the of the virial uh, equation of state. Now there's there's more terms, uh, but we're, we don't need to deal with those uh, for this for this problem. We're just doing an estimate of the compressibility factor. So uh, we are basically given everything we need to calculate z. All we all we really need is the second virial coefficient and the molar volume, uh, both of which. Um, both of which we have. So I'm going to calculate uh, using this equation 1 plus we've got the minus 197.5 and that's centimeters cubed per mole and I'm going to go ahead and convert that to um, cubic decimeters. So we need to do, there are 100 centimeters per meter, and we're going to cube that. And then there are uh, 10, 10 decimeters per meter, and we need to cube that. Right? So this, this set of calculations here is going to convert, um, convert that cubic centimeters to cubic decimeters. And then we want to divide that by the volume, which is 0 0.225 decimeters cubed. And we want that to be the molar volume, so we're going to divide by the number of moles, 0 0.104 moles. And that's going to give us the compressibility factor, which is a unitless quantity. So starting over here, in the, uh, in the numerator, we've got the 197.5. I'm going to divide that by 100 cubed. And then I'm going to multiply by 10 cubed. Then I'm going to divide by 0.225. And I'll multiply by 0.104. I'm getting a value of minus 0.09 for this portion, and then I'm going to add that to 1. And so I get a value 0 0.908. Okay, we see it's slightly less than 1, which means that uh, attractive interactions are dominating under these conditions. Now, to, to get the pressure we need to go back to this definition of the compressibility factor. So we know we have the ability to calculate the molar volume, we have the ability to calculate, we, we're given temperature, we know the compressibility factor, we can calculate the pressure. So I'm just going to solve for the pressure here. It's going to be Z times RT over VM, and then we can plug in the numbers. That's unitless. This ratio here is the molar volume, which I put in the wrong position. That should be, that should, I'm going to go ahead and just scratch it out. So we'll just do, should have put the gas constant first, 0821. We'll do liter atmospheres, mole Kelvin. Our temperature is 100K, and then we put the molar volume in the denominator. Okay, and so we'll calculate that to give us the pressure in atmospheres. I'm getting 3.4, we'll call it 4.4 ATMs, 
out of this calculation. Uh, what would we expect? I'm just going to add a follow-up problem. Uh, what would we expect for an ideal gas? Okay, so for the ideal gas, we'd have P equals RT over Vn. I got 3.79. So as you'd expect, I mean, attractive interactions are dominating. The real gas pressure is slightly less than the uh, ideal gas pressure. Well, in this next slide, we are going to talk a little bit more about the critical point and then we'll introduce a second type of equation of state that's not like the virial equation, a different type of equation of state called a cubic equation. So um, real gases, as we've shown in the previous figures, real gases exhibit a critical temperature. And above that temperature, gases cannot be liquefied no matter how much you squeeze them. Okay, so regardless of the pressure, if your temperature is above the critical point, you cannot condense the gas into a liquid because you're in this supercritical fluid state where, in fact, there is no distinction between the liquid phase and the gas phase. Uh, from a mathematical perspective, uh, the critical point is an inflection point associated with the equation of state. And let me, let me show you what I mean. So we'll go back here and look at this curve right here, this blue curve here. This is the critical temperature isotherm. You see that this point right here, this special point right here, is an inflection point along the curve. It's a point where the slope is zero and the curvature is zero. Think back to calculus. It means both the first derivative and the second derivative of the pressure with respect to volume are zero. And these are the conditions for the critical point. So if you have the equation of state, you can find the value of uh, P, V, and C, and T corresponding to um, the, critical, uh, the critical point. So from the equation of state, you can determine the critical temperature, the critical volume, and the critical pressure. Uh, this is just a conceptual question. Can oxygen, which has a critical temperature of 78 Kelvin, be liquefied at room temperature? Uh, room temperature is 25 degrees Celsius, 298 Kelvin. We see that the, the room temperature is well above the critical temperature of oxygen. So at room temperature, you cannot liquefy oxygen. You need to cool the oxygen down below 78 Kelvin before you can make liquid oxygen. So this next slide deals with an alternate approach to describing the equation of state for a real gas. Right? We know that the ideal gas uh, equation of state doesn't work when the gas is exhibiting non-ideal behavior. Uh, the virial equation is one approach you can take. Uh, it's a little cumbersome to work with. Uh, and this, this uh, family of so-called cubic equations of state um, are similar to the ideal gas equation in the sense that it's a closed equation that you can write down unlike the virial equation, which has technically an infinite number of terms, uh, that, that is, is somewhat useful. So, so what we're going to be talking about is one example of a two-parameter cubic equation of state. 
Uh, this is called the van der Waals equation of state. It's the most famous of these cubic equations of state and probably the easiest to work with. Here's the van der Waals equation. If you squint your eyes a little bit, it looks very much like the ideal gas law. Right? You have a pressure term times a volume term equals R times T. Uh, and so it looks a lot like the uh, the ideal gas equation of state, but it has these additional terms in it. Okay, It has these two parameters, A and B. Uh, a represents attractive intermolecular interactions. So the van der Waals equation takes into account, to some extent, intermolecular interactions, at least the attractive ones. And then the parameter B here is related to the size of molecules. That is, what volume is actually occupied by the molecules of a gas. So it's a correction factor for the molar volume. Or, yeah. And um, the reason this is classified as a cubic equation is because if you multiplied this equation out uh, completely, you would get a polynomial where the highest degree in the molar volume is degree 3, so a cubic equation. And there's a, there's, uh, there's a whole bunch of equations that are, that are like this, that are cubic equations of state. Uh, they have different forms and you know different parameters, but, but they all kind of work in the same way. Uh, where do these parameters come from? Well, they actually come from experimental data. So using this definition here, this mathematical definition of the critical point, right, the, critical, the critical pressure, volume, and temperature can be measured for different gases. What you can then do is take these equations and the equation of state itself and then uh, fit those derivatives and that equation to the critical data. That is, you can you can determine these equations here, right? You can find that at the critical point, the volume will be equal to three times B. The critical pressure is related to A over B squared. The critical temperature is related to A over B. You have three equations, uh, and so you can solve for um, you can solve for the values of A and B in terms of the critical data. So you can measure experimentally the critical temperature, pressure, and volume, and then you can use these to find the parameters A and B. So in the van der Waals equation, the two parameters A and B are determined from the critical point. Well, in this, in this problem, we are simply being asked to look at um, really the size of the terms uh, in the van der Waals equation. And so uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, switch over here to my camera view. I'll start with uh, the form of the van der Waals equation that we just looked at. And I think what I'll do is rearrange the equation somewhat. Here's another common way of of seeing the van der Waals equation express. It should be minus. Like that. Analyze the terms in the van der Waals equation for benzene at 400 Kelvin and one atmosphere. I guess we can't calculate the volume, but we can uh, we can discuss the size. So uh, notice that the, the, the B term is, is fairly small, okay, 0 0.1193 uh, liters per mole. So that is going to, under, under these conditions, that is going to be a very small number compared to what the molar volume would be. So this B parameter is going to be a small correction. Um, and then the A parameter this 18.57 um, uh, atmosphere liters to the 6 per mole squared, uh, that is going to be fairly small compared to the molar volume squared. Okay, so these are going to be small, small correction factors um, 
the b will be small relative to the molar volume, and then this term over here is going to be small relative to the pressure. Now it's going to make a difference in the sense that you're going to get a difference between um, the real gas pressure and what you would get for the ideal gas, uh, but, but they are going to be small, relatively small corrections, at least for these conditions of high temperature. Um, let's see here. Oh, this problem. So, so these are these are challenging problems if you don't have a computer uh, handy. So look at what it says here. Estimate the molar volume of CO2 at 500 Kelvin and 100 atmosphere by treating it as a van der Waals gas. So what they've done here is they've given you pressure, they've given you A and B, uh, they've given you temperature, and they want you to solve this equation for the molar volume, uh, which is difficult because, you know, what, what you'll get if you rearrange everything, you'll get a, um, an equation that looks like this. You'll get a cubic equation where C3, C2, and C1 here, I probably should have C1, Vn, where these are coefficients involving R, T, A, and B. So, so you'll get a cubic form, and then what you need to do is find the roots of that cubic equation. Well, that's not, that's not exactly an easy task to do with pen and paper. And so I would, um, I would of course, always solve this using uh, Mathematica. And so what I'll do here is I'll, I'll just show you how that's done. So I'll write out, um, I'll write out the Van der Waals equation here using Mathematica. this and then look at how nasty the solution is. Solve that for um, for Vm. Yuck, right? Look at all of that you'd have to comb through. You'd have to plug you'd have to plug all the parameters into these uh, into these expressions here for, for Vm, right? It's a degree three polynomial and so you get three possible roots. Two of them are going to involve the imaginary number and aren't physical, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to substitute in uh, the values here. So we've got temperature is 500, uh, pressure is 100 atmospheres, A has a value of 3.592, and then B has a value of 4.267 times 10 to the minus 2. So substituting those in, and oh, I forgot the value of the gas constant. Let's add that in. Here we get the three numbers, okay. So notice that two of the roots here are uh, involve the imaginary unit, so these are not physical. So the molar volume uh, is this value 0.051 uh, and that would be units of uh, cubic decimeters per mole. This graphic is related to that problem where they're trying to graphically illustrate the root. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just move on. Uh, what we're looking at here in this figure, this is a plot of um, the uh, equation of state, the van der Waals equation of state, uh, plotting pressure versus volume and temperature. Okay, so, so every point along this surface satisfies the van der Waals equation. And what they've highlighted here are several different temperatures corresponding to a particular ratio of T divided by Tc. So for this curve that's labeled 1, this is the critical temperature for the van der Waals equation. Uh, at these temperatures here, you're at temperatures above the, uh, above the critical temperature. And then for these curves here, you're at temperatures below the critical temperature. Uh, 
what I'm going to argue next is that these, these high temperature curves, they make sense. They're, they seem qualitatively physical, right? You have an inflection point here. It's generally hyperbolic out here. But then these, this kind of uh, loop-de-loop -loop here uh, for the low temperatures, that's actually not very physical. So let me show you a different view of that same thing. Here we're looking at a side view of the figure. So you can imagine turning this figure and looking at its profile. Here's the critical temperature. It's got that nice inflection point. These are your supercritical isotherms for the van der Waals equation. And then for the, um, for the subcritical isotherms, what you have are these weird uh, undulations in the equation of state. And that's not physical behavior. Recall from the figures that we looked at previously, what you should see experimentally is that the curves should have a plateau corresponding to the liquid vapor equilibrium while the gas is being converted into the liquid state. Uh, and so the van der Waals equation doesn't exactly show you that. However, you can reconstruct the appropriate behavior by taking this isotherm and then drawing a horizontal line through it and then adjusting the height of that line until the area above and the area below the line, that is the area between the horizontal line and the curve on both sides of the inflection point, until those areas are equal. That's referred to as the, I believe it's called the Maxwell construction or reconstruction of the, um, of the isotherms. Uh, but anyway, please note that, that this oscillation here that you see in the van der Waals equation is not actually physical. A real gas will have a horizontal line uh, when you're at subcritical temperatures. Uh, and the, uh, the last little topic I have for you is called the law of corresponding states, uh, which tells us that all gases behave, uh, behave the same when they're compared at corresponding conditions. So what does it mean to have corresponding conditions? Well, this refers to uh, what are known as re reduced quantities. Okay. So here is the definition of the reduced pressure. It's the actual pressure of the gas in whatever units we want to measure it in, divided by the critical pressure. Same thing for the molar volume. You would take the molar volume and divide it by the critical molar volume. And for the reduced temperature, you would take the real temperature divided by uh, the critical temperature. Uh, and, and you can do things like, uh, like take these quantities and then substitute them into the van der Waals equation of state. And what you see is that the parameters A and B from the van der Waals equation, they disappear. They cancel out completely. And so essentially there's really only one van der Waals equation for all gases as long as you work with these reduced quantities. The way that I like to think about this is that, you know, a gas, like I'm, I'm going to anthropomorphize a gas here, but gases don't really care what units of pressure, volume, and temperature that we humans want to use to characterize them. You know, they don't know anything about that at all. However, a gas does know what its critical pressure, critical volume, and critical temperature are. And so if you compare different gases on the same scale involving these reduced quantities, what you'll find is that all gases essentially behave the same. And here's the experimental evidence for that. Uh, what we're plotting is the compression factor as a function of reduced pressure for different reduced temperatures. And what you see is that for these different gases, they all the, the experimental data all lines up along the same curves. Okay, and so this is what we mean by uh, the law of corresponding states when two different gases are compared at the same reduced uh, reduced pressure, volume, and temperature, they behave exactly exactly the same. Here's a little follow-up problem uh, involving that. Um, suppose that you've got a sample of argon at 23 atmospheres and 200 Kelvin. What is the corresponding state of CO2? And so here we've got 
what they've given us is the um, the actual pressure of 23 atmospheres and they've given us the actual temperature of 200 Kelvin. So what we need to do is then calculate the reduced um, pressure for argon. Okay, so for argon, we've got the reduced pressure would be P divided by the critical pressure of argon. So we'd have 23 divided by 48. And the reduced temperature would be the real temp the, the temperature in Kelvin divided by the critical temperature. Uh, which would be 150.7. So these are going to be our reduced pressures and temperatures. Now, what we want to do for CO2 is we're going to use the same values of PR and TR, but we're going to rearrange the equations and solve for the P and T. So P will be the value of PR, but now times the critical pressure for CO2. And we'll do the same thing for, for the temperature. We'll take that reduced temperature that we calculated and now multiply by the critical temperature for CO2. So 72.9 ATMs. And that'll give us that'll give us the corresponding pressure and temperature for CO2. So if you compare argon under these conditions to CO2 under these conditions, you're going to find that the two gases behave identically. Okay. So these are the corresponding temperatures for those two gases. Well, I'm going to go ahead and stop this video here, and we'll jump into the next, uh, the next focus, uh, which deals with thermodynamics and the first law in the next one.